yes, so we have Linda, Lorinda, excuse me, Lorinda Toledo, who is an acquisitions editor with uh, Ibis, Jaded Ibis Press. Did I say that at all correctly? Jaded, Jaded Ibis Press, oh, okay. yes. Sorry, uh, as well as a writer herself. Hello. Uh, and now <laughs> we have Catherine Forrest, who is a, a friend of mine from when we both worked at Ro Roly Pig, um, Pig. <laughs> Roman and Littlefield Publishing Group in, thank you, honey, in um, Maryland. Um, we both moved on to other things, uh, but she's a, an editor, a scholarly editor for, uh, uh, I'll have you say more about it actually later, um, but she also writes a great blog about writing with inclusivity. So uh, that's why she's here. And then we have um, Stacy Parshall Jensen, who is also a writer, obviously, and a screenwriter, a novel fiction writer, and she's also a sensitivity reader. Uh, and so she's very knowledgeable in this. And I'm so excited to have all three of you here. Uh, and I'm going to have you all say a little bit more about yourselves in a bit. Thanks so much for having me. It's awesome to be part of this group. And um, thank you, for, Renee, for creating the space for this conversation, which I feel like is the, the most important thing is having these conversations in the space, um, or at least to get started. And um, I, as Renee said, I'm a fiction writer, um, but I also just this year actually came on as an acquisitions editor with Jaded Ibis Press. And I also teach writing um, across disciplines at Antioch University LA and freelance. And so I'll be, um, you know, I I've been thinking about this topic a lot as a writer through my PhD and MFA programs and, um, and then as an educator, it's something that comes up a lot, actually, in creative writing, but also academic and scholarly spaces. Um, and and as, as others have said, it, you know, it kind of bleeds into, you know, the fact that we are writers and we're in conversation with the world around us and what's going on um, in, in social movements, what's going on politically, and how we um, engage with with approaching our work. So I'm feel like today I'm going to be kind of speaking from that, like you all kind of how do I approach my work um, as a writer, but also as an educator um, in thinking about these issues. And then I think especially for this group, it seems like, you know, maybe talking about like, when I'm getting work as an editor, and you know, what kinds of, what am I looking for? Or what stands out? to me um, or what kinds of things like might I work on with a writer um, through the editing process, as well as like what goes into the decisions um, about what to acquire. And I think it's important to note that Jaded Ibis, um, we are a press that has a mission as a feminist nonprofit socially engaged press. So when we are, you know, evaluating work to publish that's always forefront in our minds as well. Um, so that also affects the kind of work that we choose to take on and, and put out into the world. Um, yeah, is there anything else that you wanted me to share, Renee, or? Um, no, I think that's great for now. Thank you. Thank that's you. really terrific. Catherine, why don't you go ahead? Hey, everyone. I am Catherine Forrest. My pronouns are she and her. Um, I am a an editor um, and the type of editor I am, as opposed to the type of editing that Lorinda does, is I am um, on the production and operation side of editing. So things like copy editing, proofreading, typesetting, um, managing production workflows, working with printers, um, things of that nature. Presently, I am with the American Society of Clinical Oncology. So I'm doing medical editing right now on the, uh, the journal program and some other publications. Um, at ASCO, I am the owner of the style manual. So part of the work that I do with ASCO um, is to make sure that our style manual is deliberately inclusive um, and respectful and diverse. Um, it's a big issue in medical publishing, um, particularly in terms of um, identity and making sure that we are inclusive when we talk about, for instance, people who are at risk of ovarian cancer. Um, you know, where there's a big movement away from women who are at risk of ovarian cancer. Not all people who, are, who have ovaries are women not all people who are women who have ovaries um, and so on. And, you know, also making distinctions, you know, um, being as precise as possible, precision, precision language in medicine. 
um, is respectful and it's inclusive, but it's also critical to people's health. You know, if we are talking about black people um, in the United States, we, we can't use that interchangeably with African-American. You know, those aren't the same people necessarily. Like these are largely overlapping groups, but they're not um, synonymous words. There's not, this not, you know, gender is not a more polite way to say sex. You know, it's, it's um, so the language issues is really um, the focus of my expertise. Um, prior to working at ASCO, I worked with Sage Publications doing textbooks in the higher ed space. Um, I've also worked at the Roman Littlefield Publishing Group uh, with Renee. I've worked with Adams Media, Island Press, um, Jones and Bartlett in, uh, in Massachusetts, a number of academic um, scholarly publishers, as well as fiction and trade nonfiction uh, and commercial. I also sit on ASCO's um, EDI task force on equity, diversity, and inclusion as their publishing representative. Um, I am a member of C4DISC, which is the Coalition for Diversity in Scholarly Communications. Uh, I'm on their inclusive language working group. Um, and in July, I'll be sitting for my um, board certification as an editor in the life sciences. So that's that's kind of where I'm at right now. And as Renee, I think mentioned earlier, I'm the author, editor, and publisher of Shelf Life, um, which is my biweekly newsletter on all things writing, editing, and publishing, uh, which is free to to read and subscribe to if you would like. And uh, it covers topics like this as well as other sort of writing, publishing, and industry stuff. Um, I do write. Um, fiction, uh, or I try to, um, but that is not my particular area of expertise. I am um, an editor and publisher for first and foremost. Stacy, how about yes. Hi. Um, first of all, I just want to say um, thank you for the invite to be here. I um, I think this is wonderful, and, and it is such a um, the, the topic of inclusivity and how to write and how to create characters um, and plot and story and stuff that is honor, um, honoring diversity and, um, and um, oh, I'm sorry, I see my, my husband coming this way on his roller skates or his e skates. So anyway, <laughs> um, I think this is a very timely topic. Finding in my end of day um, activity reader, cultural consultant, authenticity editor, um, is that there are so many people who who just like you have these questions and they are doing the work um, now, doing it before they get to publications. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. Hold on one second. Oh, here. Thank you. I left my phone. My husband just put me my phone on his blades. Anyway, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, you guys. Um, no, as I'm saying, it's um, it's really exciting to do this work. Now, um, uh, as an editor, as a sensitivity reader, I have worked with um, children's books. Um, Um, I have served as an authenticity reader for uh, for TV uh, uh, TV projects, uh, half hour comedies, and full length um, dramas. Um, because I I also um, as a writer, I do creative writing in fiction, but I also a screenwriter. So that is an additional skill I'm able to bring, where I can understand how the TV project is needs to be made or the pilot. You know, understanding that world, but also including including the respect and authenticity that um, that they are striving for. You know, I think we have a very powerful public voice that many projects have seen that they they didn't do the sensitivity work be beforehand. They didn't um, try to be as honorable and respectful as they can, and things have changed. Readers don't, you know, won't stand for that anymore. And they make that very clear. So I believe doing all the work up front, just like other research, doing all the work up front now could actually save the life of the project later, um, save, the, save the life of the actual book later. So um, anyway, um, what else do you need to know? Yes, I'm in Minnesota right now. I, I live in Minneapolis. Um, I'm from Minneapolis and, and um, was in LA for about 
11 years. And then my husband, and I moved back here to be with his parents and with more family and then COVID hit. So we ended up staying here <laughs> for a while, but um, I'm working on a, a couple of different TV projects that will bring me back to LA this fall. And everything I write has diverse cast of characters and my leads are all, are always mixed blood um, women, <laughs> you know, so it's cathartic for me. So um, anyway, I am so happy to be here and I would love to know um, and answer your questions that you may have um, about how you create the characters you want to create or tell the story that, that you are driven to tell. That's, that's my job is just to help that. So thank you, Renee, for inviting me. Awesome. I'm so glad to have you here. Um, uh, so while uh, there will be time for some q and I hope, but I'm going to start off with a whole bunch of questions. And I'm going to actually start with Stacy while, uh, <laughs> while you're pinned. But uh, um, so tell us a little bit more about what you do as a sensitivity reader, like what, like technically, what kind of things do you look for? What, you know, are there some mistakes that you see over and over again, that kind of thing? Okay. Um, let's see, when I do a sensitivity read for a project, my goal is to, um, to look for hidden and unconscious biases and um, stereotypes. Um, and and I, I make it very clear when a writer contacts me or a publishing company, um, publishing firm contact, contact, contacts me. Um, I've worked with literary agents before too, so I'm very clear that, um, that it's hidden or unconscious. Um, because everybody has biases and oftentimes we don't know exactly what they are and it takes somebody else's eyes to pick that up. The things that I usually find um, are small things that actually mean a lot, like something like um, um, oh, a description of a character of color and works um, often times writers will only describe this the actual color of a character of color but they don't describe the white characters the same way so when you look at the whole cast of characters in a book only the the colors the characters color stand out and there's an assumption that is made that all the other characters are white i think that that's part of this um historical way of writing and viewing story that that are that has always been told through a white lens that all characters are white unless stated otherwise, which is a bias. So I will point that out. Um, as a reader, I never ever touch manuscript. I never edit anything. I never change words. That is on the writer to decide to do for themselves. But I will point it out and do cut and paste into your report and explain, you know, well, this is what this is why this um, is a hidden bias. And these are some, suggest some suggestions to address that. You know, you either go back and expand the, um, the description of all of your characters when we meet them. Um, definitely look at how you are describing the characters of color. Um, <laughs> please don't use um, food as a way of um, describing the skin color, you know, like um, coffee colored or, um, honey caramel colored skin, you know, things that um, a lot of people think, well, that's a compliment when actually by listening to the people that you're actually writing about, and that's what inclusivity includes, listening to them, it is not a compliment to be compared to food, but it is something that happens quite a lot. Um, the, and the other thing that I've caught, and this has just been more recently and like probably the last six months or so, is that a lot of writers are so cautious and they want to be so respectful that they don't tell enough. And so I'm told um, in the initial uh, request for the read, you know, while I have three characters who are indigenous that I would like you to look, look closely at and, you know, two characters that are, are Black. Well, then I read the, the novel and I can't figure out who the indigenous characters are because there's just not enough in there. So the writer's thinking, you know, well, I know that this right this character, you know, Th Thomas is is um, indigenous, and so I can talk around about what he does and stuff, but they completely skip identifying him. 
Um, which therefore means that the character is not being fully fleshed out as, as much as it can possibly can be. So um, that was something that it was interesting to me to find out that that hesitation that's in place. So I'll point it out. Um, with, and, I, and again, I include some suggestions. Um, my read projects um, in the contract and the agreement, um, it always includes feedback. Um, and it's not an additional cost to have the, the writer write back and forth. And some of them I've been in you know, longer conversations with via email when they have more questions or they do some revisions or, and stuff um, with, the, with the intent of being as respectful as they possibly can. So of course I'm on board. Um, another thing that I found that was really interesting and, and have had a difficulty with this um, uh, has to do with the technical part of when white writers use the n-word um and oftentimes it's something that's historical um like in the time of slavery or something you know there'll be characters where that is how they speak and i get that and that's fine it's like well that it's that character you know however the narrator who's who's telling the story is writing in like third person past tense, so they're writing from today, they know that the use of that N-word is controversial and um, to say the least, and derogatory. So there's a big difference between having a character use it and having the narrator read it, uh, use it. The reactions that they could possibly get would come against the narrator or the writer and not the character. And this is really hard to like, take in and define sometimes. Um, but when it's on the page, it's really easy to point out from my point of view. And um, and like I said, I've had a couple of writers who I've had to really, you know, break it down with them along with suggestions on, you know, these are the places that, you know, you don't have to use them word. There, you know, there are ways to be really creative, you know, to discuss the this particular, you know, gang of black men. Uh, if that's what you're writing about without having to use the n-word as the narrator um uh let's see um i'm trying to think so, yeah the Sorry. technical thing really stand out yeah that's great that's really awesome and i have a, a bunch of follow-up questions but i actually want to talk to uh to sort of everyone oh. <laughs> so i'm going to um yes you know, my job as a moderator. Uh, I'm going to move on and ask Catherine uh, sort of the same question, but not quite the same. Um, so, and you, Catherine, you, pardon me, you talked a little bit about, you know, the sort of language approaches that you take, which is amazing. Um, how do you, how do you approach authors about changing their language? How do you, you know, especially if they're unwilling find authors who don't want to change, especially if it's already been accepted for publication or something like that? Yes, absolutely. So, um, you know, just, I'll speak from my recent experience, um, but this this has followed me my entire career. Um, yes, I think that for the most part, the authors I meet who are unwilling um, or do not want to make, you know, these kinds of changes um, for sensitivity and respect and inclusive inclusivity reasons, it's not because they, don't want to be inclusive it's or that they actively want to not be inclusive it's often because they don't understand why it's important um they don't understand why to make a change you know and when we're talking about medical writing you know i've had to talk to people and say you know we need to change the way we talk about people who are at risk for diseases like when we're talking about the groups of people the demographic groups of people who are at risk of diseases when we need to talk about you know social determinants of health when we need to talk about health policy and advocacy you know we need to use precision language because this is you know affecting outcomes and people say well you know if someone feels like they're non-binary you know can't they just know that they have ovaries and that means them you know that's very exclusive and that you know that pushes people out of a medical setting and they don't get the care that they need so part of what i have to do is identify try to identify why someone is resistant to making this kind of change and oftentimes they just kind of are saying like well i understand that it exists but i don't understand why it's important in this context you know why are we why are you pushing so hard to request that our authors 
give us their pronouns in their profile setup. You know, why is that important? This is a workplace setting. Um, I don't care what someone's gender identity is in the workplace. It doesn't matter. It should have no place in the workplace. Well, sure it doesn't, but you know, if you, the minute you say, well, Catherine's running a few minutes late, she's in traffic. You brought my gender identity into the conversation because you said she. So, you know, you can't exist in a workplace without, I wish that we could. <laughs> I wish that we could have a completely gender neutral, but our language doesn't work that way. Um, you know, and it's it's not so much about whether it's important that the author I'm working with is a man or a woman. What's important is normalizing for people being asked, asking and being asked. You know, I don't want to look at someone and, and just guess. You know, I wouldn't look at someone's skin color and just guess how they identify themselves. I wouldn't guess that someone identifies as Latina versus, you know, Mexican versus, you know, Afro-Caribbean. I wouldn't make that guess. And I don't want someone to look at me and go, well, that's a woman. That's a she right there. You know, I don't want people to have to guess that about me. So it's trying to understand where people are coming from when they are resistant to these kinds of changes and helping them understand why these changes are important. And one of the things that, you know, when people kind of take a hard line and they really dig in, um, you know, I say to them, like, I'm not telling you that you have to agree with me. I'm not telling you that you have to believe this. I'm not telling you that you have to, you know, believe in changing laws, believe in changing, you know, ethics or morality or anything like that. But I am telling you that it's important to be respectful to people. Like, even if you don't understand it, even if you don't agree, if you are putting your writing out in a public place and a publisher is going to stand behind it, you have to be inclusive and respectful of human beings. You just have to. Um, or, you know, if you really don't want to do that, you can self-publish your work and have it say whatever you want. You know, that's that's also an option that you can you can do. But more and more publishers I work with, and I mean, I've, I've recently, like I've spoken with some folks at Pearson, um, Pearson Learning, like everyone I speak to in publishing is constantly looking at the inclusivity and the diversity of their product, you know, from every every aspect of it, you know, every um, the art program is it inclusive? You know, do we have pictures showing all white people? Do we have you know? If you are doing a, um, I used to work on a, the criminal justice list at Sage Publications, and you know this was a big issue. Authors, you know, white authors, as uh, you know, Stacy mentioned implicit bias, right? And you know, bias that you don't realize you have would submit an art program, and all the incarcerated people that you see in the photo in the art program are black. Like <laughs> this isn't. This isn't representative of, you know, of reality. It's someone's in, implicit bias being, and you go to them and say, well, we have to completely change your art program. Why? I don't, I don't understand why that's important. Um, you know, and it's, it, the, the key is educating people about why it's important to do this, even if you don't agree, even if you feel in your heart of hearts that like, you know, you, you did it fine and you, you were coming from a place of meaning well. Um, I try to point out to people that we judge ourselves by our intentions, but we judge others by the effects of their actions on us and on those around us. And um, so it's, it's great if your intentions were coming from a good place, but if the effect of your action is that you were exclusive of people, that you were not diverse, um, that you're not respectful, then you have to rethink, you know, I, I get it, your intentions were great. I don't think you're a bad person, but you know, we have to, we have to make some changes to get this to a place where it's appropriate. Um, and while I don't, you know, I don't edit fiction right now, which I, I know is what a lot of people um, in this group like to write, um, I do know for a, a hard fact that um, the thin excuses of the past are not holding up anymore the way they used to. When, uh, you know, authors will say, oh, well, you know what, it, that's just how it was back then. Look, Black people and queer people were not invented in 1990. Like, we've we've always been around like if history the history that you know excludes these people don't perpetuate that re-examine the history that you think you know you know don't or i don't know anyone like that well think about why that is instead of you know like i'm just gonna write my story with no people like that because i don't know anyone like that that doesn't mean those people don't exist you know that means that either that means that people like that whatever like that is like Think about why they might not be in your social circle. Like it, it's probably not because they're not around, right? It, it might be that you need to reevaluate why you don't attract people like that to your social circle and to be your friend. I get, I get a lot, like my best friend is transgender and I hear a lot of people say to me, um, well, I couldn't write a transgender character. I, I don't know anyone who's transgender. There's no one like that in my, you know, and I've never met anyone like that. And I'm like, you know, 
a lot of transgender people are invisible. You probably know some transgender people. I mean, it's it's highly likely that you know some trans people. If if none of them have come out to you, consider why that is. Like, think about why that might be. Interesting. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. It's so funny because you say, you know, treating humans with respect, like that's a hard thing that shouldn't be such a hard thing to do. Why is it controversial? <laughs> you know, my, my mother, bless her, you know, she is a generation older than me. And she is, um, you know, she says to me, she's like, I don't always understand this stuff. I don't really, you know, I don't understand the Jess was a boy and now Jess is a girl, like, you know, but that doesn't mean I can't be respectful while I'm figuring it out. Nice. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Um, Lorinda, let's turn over to you. So uh, Catherine mentioned, you know, as that as sort of as a publisher or and that publishers now generally are looking for own voices and, you know, uh, trying to to bring more people of color into it. So how what do you look for when you're looking for that? How do you approach that? Do you start from I guess you start from the author themselves as opposed to the work. How do you <laughs> go ahead? And... Um, that, these are great questions. Um, <laughs> so you, you get in, the question gets into layers, right? Because it has to do with not only the authors, not only the work, the text that is in front of you, um, but also who are the gatekeepers at different levels, right? Who are the editors? Who are the agents who are making the decisions to you know which books ultimately get the green light um and I, i'll i'll speak to that from i'll kind of go in reverse so starting with you know um elizabeth early who's one of the you know the founders of of jaded ibis press in its current incarnation um she and and the others on the board, they wanted to ensure that there is inclusivity. And so, I mean, I just came on this year, but one of the reasons that I came on along with my two other colleagues um, who are acquisitions editors, Nana Ama um, Dankwa, I hope I'm saying her name right. I've only, I haven't had the pleasure of meeting her yet, unfortunately. And um, Lisa um, Pegram. Um, they are, we were all brought on through a grant that Jaded Ibis received um, to bring on specifically um, women of color into these acquisitions uh, positions because they wanted um, to diversify, um, um, you know, some of the people making those decisions, also wanting um, us to be able to reach out to our networks, um, which I will say, like, uh, <laughs> getting into like someone's networks too is also a tricky issue because coming out of academia a lot of you know I was like the only Latina in my creative writing uh PhD you know so like there's a lot of um like who who do we know in the actual writing community or, ac or the academic space versus also opening up those doors for people who maybe don't have access to the same opportunities um, but are, are still doing great work too. Um, and so I think looking also out of those traditional spaces of, of academia and publishing in order to truly open those doors also requires um, another way of seeing. And, and what I mean by that is breaking out of maybe a mold that we've been taught, like literature is supposed to look one way and like interrogating that um, and that that this I think speaks across the board, whether you're a writer, an editor, publisher, anyone, right? Like thinking about how a work might represent um, a particular worldview, whatever that worldview is, and that um, the decisions that go into crafting that work, um, considering when maybe something that challenges me, I'll, I'll speak to myself as, as a reader or as an editor, actually digging into that and trying to think about why does it challenge me too? And really considering as I'm reading it, um, whether that is being done in a productive way or, um, and, 
and how that can, I think, you know, since I'm getting work that I'm making a decision on whether to accept or reject, um, how successfully is that being done? Um, what needs to go into it to really bring it to fruition successfully in terms of the writer's vision? And also like Catherine mentioned and, and Stacy mentioned, what's something that I wanna stand behind and that I can stand behind as an editor and that Jaded Ibis can stand behind as a publisher? Um, so it's all very like interwoven, right? All these complex um, circles. But I think um, it starts with ensuring that there is as much access as possible to, um, you know, whether it's writing programs, writing classes, creating positions in the publishing industry. Um, I was also an editor on literary journals before, so creating, you know, um, positions in those spaces. And then when I'm getting work, um, yeah, really intentionally telling, to me, it's important to really say, like, I'm also, I'm really looking for work from people of color. I want to read your words. I want to read your stories. Um, and I'm going to be mindful of, um, your worldview that you're bringing to the table. And of course, I'm also interested in reading work that I see myself in um, as a Latina and um, you know, feeling that that resonates with me, but it doesn't exclusively have to resonate with me. It can be a, you know, um, something that, that resonates um, in terms of the, the human connection but that's, but I think it, what I'm trying to say is every book has a point of view. Every book has a perspective, even if you don't think it does, or you're not aware of what that is. And we have to really interrogate what that is when we're sending our work out into the world. Um, and then I, and then as an editor, I'm looking for work that, that I can stand behind in, in that way that feels like that work has gone into it. Um, because that work that I'm doing as an acquisitions editor or even a lit journal editor where, you know, you're not really going to develop these pieces. You're going to decide whether you want to publish them or not immediately, you know, accept or reject um, versus an educator where there is that space to, to have dialogue with students and try to engage with them and share more resources. And it's not that, it's not that I can't, I, I mean, I, of course, it's part of my role as an editor to develop writers and point out what's working or not in their work. But I think sometimes it's a question of stepping back and getting more education um, before we kind of just send our work out into the world, um, which I think is what Catherine and Stacy were saying. So I got into like a lot of different areas there, um, but I, I hope I answered your question and let me know if you need me to clarify anything. No, that's great, thank you. Um, I, I think I'm gonna go ahead and add uh, Catherine and Stacy, uh, although my question, uh, let's see, I'm gonna add myself for a minute too. I, 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 and again, remember you can, you can choose to cho select the, um, the gallery view instead, if you don't want to look at just the four of us, but <laughs> so, uh, I want to ask a follow-up question that I feel sort of, I feel badly asking, but I feel like it needs to be asked. <laughs> Um, I am absolutely for uh, promoting own voices and having more people of color uh, and or not just of color, but of different experiences come forward and write their own stuff. But you'll notice that the majority of us here in this room <laughs> are white, uh, cisgender, hesgen, you know, head, I'm assuming I'm making assumptions here a little bit, but um, we're mostly white and uh, cisgendered and we want to publish stuff too. Um, so how best can we be inclusive and how best can we get our stuff in front of gatekeepers at the same time? Does that make sense? Is that awful? <laughs> and at, at least we're all women. So we have that minority. Whereas, whereas like my husband, he's, he's just, he's all the, he's everything that's been published before. And I still want to tell him, you know, you can still publish stuff too. So. So, uh, yeah. Well, you 
know, I'll just jump in and, and throw out there because this is something that I see a lot. I see on, I've seen it on Query Tracker. I see it in a lot of, of forums that there are white people and there are men um, who will say, you know, I feel like I'm at a real disadvantage now because everybody, you know, you look at every manuscript wish list and people want, you know, people want writer, writers of color, people want, you know, queer writers, own voices, and, you know, and what about let's keep in mind that the vast majority of the publishing industry and the people who are making decisions are white women, wow. um, cisgender white women. That's still true. Um, and although like if we picture, you know, the publishing, what's going to get published in a given year, for example, as a pie, mm -hmm. the majority of that pie is still going to men and white people and cisgender people. I mean, there is a larger slice, you know, we're, we're, um, intentionally trying to get to equity, um, to like an equitable, you know, division of that pie for all kinds of people. Um, but I, I do want to say, I don't think that, that we're at a point where, um, white people and men need to worry that they are being discriminated against in the publishing industry. Although I have definitely encountered people who who do feel that way and just say, you know, oh, well, as a man, I can't even get my manuscript looked at. Um, yeah, that's not true. Yeah, that's, no, that's not true. Um, but I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll just leave with that. And, and I have a lot of thoughts on this, but I want to hear everyone's thoughts too. Yeah, I am. I, I will chime in and I totally agree. Totally agree what Catherine just said, you know, uh, if to go further with that pie, um, the, the vision of that pie and see how, you know, what, how big the slice is that is actually going to own voices and um, diverse voices or whatever for all the inclusivity, it's still really, really small compared to everything else that's being published. Specifically for writers, um, and then I, and I've had this question asked too, um, of me, you know, asked to me, well, what, what am I supposed to do? Because I'm a, I'm a white writer and, and I, you know, I can't get published or, or, or something. Or um, Munch comes in when they think, well, I guess I'm going to have to um, make a character be a character of color. I guess I'm going to make a change so it's more urban or like, you know, places in the cities that has more people of color. Um, when people start doing that, and, and that's not really the story they want to tell, and that's when they fall into using stereotypes that are really harmful. That's when they start um, showing their biases. And to them, I just tell them, just like I tell like the writers of color that I work with, or queer writers, or, you know, I, I tell them, you know, well, write the story you want to tell. You know, as when I began, um, when I began writing, I, um, for, I, for my first um, my first MFA is in Creative Friday. And the hardest thing to hear was when people said that they couldn't relate to anything I was writing because my characters were of color. Like it was really hard to go, but this is what I want to do. I don't, I don't want to do anything else. And this is what I feel like I need to study and stuff. And so I guess I'm just going to have to do it and stay in that tiny sliver. I went to film school, was told the same thing. The industry's not going to buy, you know, your, your screenplays when you have women of color as your leads. Now that was 2010. So that was a while ago, thank God. Things have changed, but even then it's a teeny tiny sliver. So yeah. I guess for that question, I would still say, would well, just tell the story you want to tell because odds are you're going to get published long before I would. You know, it's, that's still the way that things are. We have a long way to go before we get to anything that remotely resembles um, um, equality. We, we really do, that's that's the truth. That is why we're all doing, you know, this work that we're trying to do, but ultimately, you know, head to the bookstores and look around and you'll see this little section for, for this um, particular culture, or this particular ethnic group or something in this little section, and then you still have the rest of the store. That's that's still the way things are. Right. And it's like literature. Is there any way? Stacy, is there any way that you could move your camera just a little bit? Because you're right on the side and half the, half your face isn't in it. Excellent. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I'm sitting in my car. I was going <laughs> to mention that, but I didn't. So thank you. Whoever. Um, 
Uh, Lorinda, did you want to add anything to that? And, and uh, by the way, I'm, thank you all for taking this question. I feel like I said, I didn't want to be like all lives matter and that kind of shit. Cause I absolutely, <laughs> uh, you know, Ooh. absolutely agree with everything you all are saying. It's a good uh, question. Um, one of the things that I think, okay, I have two main thoughts that I want to add. One is that um, because that, that what writers who, who represent the dominant white male gaze need to understand is that people who have been marginalized for so long from publishing, from academia, from these spaces, right? That have been dominated by white male privilege is that we're all so quick to discount ourselves that we don't belong here. Oh, my stuff's not good enough. Oh, it's not the kind of thing that publishers want to see. So when publishers and agents and writing programs are saying, we want, we want you, <laughs> we want you writers of color to come to, to send us your work. We want you, you have to, we have, it's really positive that that's being said really strongly. It has to be said strongly because it's not, it's not gonna get through otherwise. You know, um, I work with a lot of students um, who are getting their master's degrees or PhDs and because of a legacy of marginalization, they don't even know how brilliant they are. <laughs> they don't like recognize that they belong in these spaces. And I have to work with them. I work a lot as a one-on-one -on -one writing tutor with Antioch. And a lot of times we're talking about writing processes, but we're also talking about like overcoming that deeply internalized voice that you're not good enough. You don't belong here. Um, sorry, it's like making me emotional because I'm so passionate about it. Um, I, I just went through this with a student actually, or with, frankly, it's most of the students I work with who are from disenfranchised communities. Um, whereas when I work with a student who comes from um, a more privileged background or even, you know, like myself, like I'm Latina, but I can present as white and I, you know, um, am part of a generation that due to oppression has been assimilated, you know, largely assimilated the dominant culture, which, you know, I had to interrogate all those things myself too. And, and my identity as a New Mexican Latina is a very complex mixture of colonizer and colonized. And it's up to me to take responsibility to interrogate that intersectionality. And why shouldn't it be also the responsibility of the white male to interrogate how he got that privilege? Because <laughs> I guarantee there, there was a lot of erasure going on and a lot of um, problematic things that need to be looked at. Um, that and so what I'm trying to say is that really when it's being shouted from the rooftops that we need diverse voices we need we need own voices and diverse books that that's being shouted because we're trying to get through these centuries of oppression that have said shut up and sit down you know um and um the other point I want to make is that um when it comes to reading work that's sent to me it doesn't mean I'm not gonna look at your work because you're not a writer of color, unless I specifically said, we're only looking for work from writers of color. I'm still gonna look at your work. And the idea that there's not enough space for everyone is also a legacy of this, you know, colonial mindset, a scarcity mindset that I have to take what's mine and everyone's out for themselves versus more of a community-based mindset that, you know, we can all, that all boats rise together, right? Like if, if one person has success, it can spell success for many other people. It doesn't have to mean that there's not enough space for you, you know? Um, the more of us that are, I think, invited into the publishing and writing and, and all these spaces that were kind of overlapping, the more opportunities there will be for everybody, I think. Absolutely. Oh my goodness. Thank you, Lorinda. Yeah, that, that is so, so hugely important. Everything you just said, I, I was going to say that too, that it's, we have to, 
like, I feel like that's a lot of what we see on Twitter, which is, you know, horrible, <laughs> is that, you know, if this person gets it, that means I can't. And it's not a zero sum game. It is not, you know, there is room enough for everybody. And, and what you're saying about colonization too, that's one of those big words where I always, <laughs> I don't always know what it means, you know, but, but white people, obviously, you know, that's not to say that not all white people don't feel secure you know we we all have these moments of self self doubt too and i'm not good enough and all this stuff but it's it's much more surface level <laughs> i'm not good enough as opposed to i'm not good enough because of centuries of racism where i've been pushed to the side you know i'm not good enough it's more i'm not good enough because i just don't feel confident you know so it's a much different level if you will you know um, I want to interject quickly, like I think it's telling that a person who is part of a marginalized community might feel like, you know, I'm not good enough because I don't belong in this space. Whereas someone who is part of the majority is going, the only reason I don't have a spot in this space is because someone else got an unfair advantage and took it. Like they feel like that is their space. You know, this is the space for white people. This is the American publishing industry. And anyone else who's coming into it is taking a spot from me. But that's not, that's not true, right? You know, that's it. I think if there's a presumption of I should have had a space, but then someone else got an unfair advantage, like that's coming from a place of extreme privilege. And that's something that we need to like examine in ourselves. Like why, why do we feel that way? And in all things, academics, you know, it's very, it's very common in like academic admissions and and um jobs and employment and things like that. Like, why do we feel like the default person for it was me? And the only reason I didn't get it is because someone else, you know, was treated okay. with, with extra, with something extra. I have never had that kind of confidence, but yeah, it's true. It's so true. Um, I, can I also just add quickly, um, it's also a, a misunderstanding that, um, that white people are not affected by racism and colonialism. And some of the, um, and what I mean by that is like, whether, you know, you're part of a, maybe you're a, a white person, but you're from a, you know, part of a legacy of maybe like, you know, your, your own, there are many people whose like own cultural identities were, became submerged into the dominant culture, right? Into the, the white dominant presenting culture as a mode of survival and, and hierarchy and all these things. But also, um, even if, you know, you're a white person from a, a family that never thought about race or that were white supremacists or something, you're still affected by these mindsets. And, and it's toxic. It is toxic in our societies and in our communities. So it's definitely not to say that, that white folks are, are um, immune to that toxicity. Oh. whatever it may be, it, we all have to confront it, you know, and, and try to heal from it. Um, yeah, I'll leave it there for now. No, that's absolutely true. Thank you. Um, yeah. Marcia said in the chat, the scarcity concept is part of white supremacism. It's a zero sum mindset. Yeah, it's so true. Um, I was going to say something else, but of course I forgot it. So we'll move on. Um, let's get into the nitty gritty a little bit. So, so, so how can we write um, different character? And when I different characters, you know, and different uh, diverse characters. And when I say characters, I want to say that in the very general sense. So it doesn't have to be a fictional character. It can be a non-fictional character, a real person within a non-fiction piece of writing as well as within a fiction writing. I don't want to just, you know, because it, you know, you'll have a center of your story, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, and the same thing should apply. So I don't want people to say, well, I don't write nonfiction. I mean, you know, I only write nonfiction, so this doesn't apply to me. So how do we, uh, how do we put inclusive characters, diverse characters into our stories? Why should we, when should we? Let's get into that a little bit. And uh, whoever wants to start. <laughs> Anyone? Bueller? <laughs> okay, well, um, I'll start. Um, I think um, 
Well, I'll start with the why, why we should. I think it's when we look at the world we live in, you know, this is the world, you know, it is, you know, um, very diverse. And if that is your setting for whatever you're writing, again, fiction or nonfiction, then you have to pay attention to that and you want to paint the world as it is. Now, that being said, how you do it, and this is something I heard from, um, from some of the, the writers who are with us today, which is wonderful, is research, research, research. And go to that, that um, population, go to that group of people, go you know, do the work to go and talk to them um, respectfully and find out, you know, what is, what is your lived experience uh, that I want to tell? Um, and, 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 and like I said, do that respectfully, you know, especially, you know, I, I read a lot um, for indigenous um, characters and topics and so on, but especially for, for something like that, you know, you have to go find the, the elders of that particular tribe. Know that, that not all Native Americans are the same, you know, and that there, that there is a lot of um, reverence and, and respect within each, each nation. And so you go and you find them and you, you talk to them and you do all that research and you make sure that you're telling the story as it is. The other thing that I would want, um, want to mention is that also remember the, your perspective that you have going into the work. You know, um, um, for example, years ago, do you remember when The Help came out? You know, the book, the book The Help came out and then the movie came out. And there were a lot of people, um, um, readers and audience of color, that were really upset because they said that didn't, that's not, that's not how it is, you know, and they went, you know, this is how the black people were being characterized and portrayed and that's not really it. And, and a lot of them came to me and said, you know, you know, what did you think? Was that awful? And I didn't find it that awful because the story was being told through the perspective of a young white girl thinking about her life and her relationship to her black maid, her black help. You know, is that the way it really was for all black people? No. Is it her perspective? Because we're talking about one person who's telling the story. Yeah. So when you start to include characters of color and different um, ethnicities and different communities and stuff, just remember your place. It's not about staying in your lane, but it's about remember that you're, if your perspective is from yourself, remember that. Do not become a savior. You know, don't, don't feel you have to or should or would want to be the white person to come in to save everything, you know, to help all the poor, you know, brown folk, you know, that's something that stands out really, really largely and is very derogatory. So, so don't do that. Just, you know, come in with humility, come in with respect, um, tell the story from there. And um, which what ends up happening is that you get these really beautiful interwoven communal type stories that are respectful of everybody. And, and those are the stories that live on. Those are the stories that people get excited about and, and that we talk about, like on, you know, Black Twitter, where we're just like, oh, this one is working really well, and this is why. You know, it's, it's very possible to be a white writer to and in, write inclusivity. You know, it's just, you know, slowing down and thinking about, well, what is needed for me to do that in the most respectful way? Can I ask a... So that's my opinion on it. Thank you. That's great. I, I just want to ask a really quick question about the help <laughs> since you brought it up. And I'm glad to hear you say that because I love that movie, actually. I actually think it's a great movie. Um, but I but I know that there is some criticism about it and I wasn't quite sure on what it was. My question is, do you yeah. feel that it's do you feel that it's doing that? Like, do you feel that that it's portraying um, I can't even remember the lead character's name as a white savior or is that part of the, you know, the complaint, too, or not necessarily? Oh, well, I think, well, I think the help had a lot of problems. I mean, I mean, by me saying that I wasn't upset about it, it was only because I, rem I just thought, well, it's a white woman, you know, telling this story. Um, there's a bit of a savior thing going on with her. And there's, you know, she definitely shows her privilege. Um, but, but that's all, but that is who the character is, you know? So I guess my point is that I wasn't upset that, the black characters were portrayed the way they were because the perspective was coming from this white woman. Um, so, 
in that case, that's an example of that. The help is not, in my opinion, an example of a book that um, has done it well. <laughs> you know, I, I definitely don't think the help did. I just don't think that, um, that I just didn't get all riled up about it like a lot of people did because I, you know, looked at the perspective. You know, um, this has come up again in, um, well, in film, like we were just talking about this again. My, my husband just saw The Revenant again, you know, and so we we're having a long discussion about who tells, you know, who writes race, who tells which stories. And there are other elements stories that can be, that are, are well done, even if they don't actually, you know, promote inclusivity the way that I would like to see, you know. Um, and for those, I have to remember, oh, it's Tarantino, he's revisionist, white guy. Of course, this movie's gonna look like this. You know, it's those that, um, like him and the, and then other authors who who are not aware of their own privilege or they they stand on their own privilege or their own perspective of being white and they like um like Catherine like you I think you know you said a lot of times people think well why why do I have to pay attention to this because I don't think it's a problem like I don't get it it's those readers are the ones who just you know really um uh you know, work, work from a point of stereotype or they become saviors or, and not see that they're doing it. You know, um, um, I'm trying to think of, you know, let me think. And I'm sure there's, I, I am drawing a blank right now, but to some books that are, that were written by white authors that did a great job, you know, but I definitely think, like I said, you know, my first answer to this question, it's really about research and being, um, having humility, being humble in your approach, being respectful in your approach. I, I want to ask another question. And again, I, I feel, I hope I'm not embarrassing myself, but I probably am because I, I feel like I'm asking kind of ignorant questions, but. No, I, I, Renee, can I just say quickly, I am glad you're asking these questions because these are questions that I think people will ask each other. And then without having anybody around to actually help you through the answer, the questions don't get answered or they get answered incorrectly and you kind of stay stuck, you know, wondering about these things. So I am loving that you're asking. Yeah. Asking oh, the question so, is a sign of not being ignorant. Good. Being oh, ignorant is, is assuming that it doesn't, you don't need to ask. True. Right. True. Good. I'm so glad. I am trying. That's, that's the thing I think is important. Maybe it's important and maybe I'm just like trying to pat myself on the back, but I think it's important that we try to, to learn about this stuff and try to figure this out, which is why I wanted to do this panel. Um, so, uh, and, and I obviously I want all three of you to be able to answer too, but so keeping a little bit on this topic, just a little bit more is that I also feel like uh, because of our privilege, perhaps white, ne white people need to be allies for people of color, for transgender people, for, for, you know, for every other experience. And so like, I'm going back to Joss Whedon, who uh, I'm a big fan of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, always, ha you know, have been for years. Um, uh, I can't say always have been, but anyway, and of course he's in the news again for, for being a terrible person. Uh, sorry, uh, you know, he's in the news again for being terrible, but I feel like at least in the nineties, the late 90s, he did a lot for putting women front and center with Buffy. And so I think it's important to have those allies, but then it gets tricky, you know, how do we do that? So I guess if we take it back to the sort of nitty gritty and the specifics of writing characters and writing, and writing, how do we do all those things without being, you know, how do we be an ally? How do we put people of color front and center as white people you know, so can, can I, or whatever, can I jump in here? Um, cause I love to talk about the writing process and, um, I think part of it is that we have to embrace the process as writers, as opposed to this, you know, like this results oriented mindset, we'll get to the results if we engage in the process. And so with that, what that looks like is, you know, writing into the topic, both in terms of drafting the novel itself or the or the the book whatever it is you're working on but also like maybe free writing around the topic free writing into those places where you feel that resistance 
you know, in the body or, or in some way that, um, that you're like, okay, well, this is bringing some things up for me, or I feel like I'm out of my element here. Maybe you just take some space and time to like interrogate that and free write about it. The other thing is, I think one of the richest things that can happen is to write into what we don't know and into the questions in the actual work itself. That's where we can get to some really rich and nuanced um, writing that really brings these questions into our society. You know, um, we should all be interrogating. We should be having our own racial and social justice reckonings within our own selves, you know, and then bringing those questions into our work. We don't need to approach the writing itself. Um, I think where we get into trouble is where we feel like we have to pretend like we know what we're talking about, as opposed to like that place of humility and like seeking and then seeing what epiphanies arise in the work as well as in ourselves um, through that. And one of the books I had, I know you're going to share resources, Renee, but one of the books I recommended is David Murrah's book. Um, on, it's a craft book on writing um, called The Stranger's Journey. Um, you know, why is it that it seems like mostly only people of color are reading craft books or interrogating their race in their in their work. And that's kind of what David Murrah bring, you know, I love that this group isn't doing that. I love that you're not doing that, Renee. And that's what David Murrah brings in. Like these books are for everybody to interrogate how we write about race. What messaging have we internalized that we are bringing into our work and and Instead, we could be interrogating that messaging in our work and doing something really meaningful. Um, additionally, in terms of process, just like Stacy said, in seeking out people, um, also like seeking out the literature of the people you're writing about. You know, like if you're writing about indigenous people, think how, how little you may have been ex exposed to the writings of indigenous people in your education formally. And so that's going to mean like doing some investigation and, and finding that and familiarize what better way to get to know people, a people than through their, through their work. Right. And, and at the same time, recognizing that not that some cultures are, are coming from an oral history. So basically I think through encountering the literature though, you can start to um, get to know the values of these people. That's, how, that's why we read stories. Right, we're internalizing um, the values that those stories hold for us, and so we should seek outside sources. And that goes for research too. That's really important. That's something that comes up a lot because marginalized folks have been left out of um, the publishing and and academic communities. Try to seek out the researchers and writers and people of color who are writing about the topic in particular, um, and not just. Um, you know, I think canonical um, white folks who might be, might have taken up those spaces in, in larger ways, right? Look and see who else, who else, what other voices are out there that you can bring in and then writing into that and interrogating it. That's, that's kind of what I want to communicate there. Yeah. Thanks. I just have a question. Don't you think life experiences though really um, come into feeling with writers. I know I'm a good two generations older than most of you, and for sure one at least. Um, I worked at a bank for years with an enormous number of people from of every ethnicity there could possibly be, and got to know everyone well, very well. And um, so you learn this way. And yet then we speak to, you know, I, I was listening to J.A. Jantz, who was told by her publisher, oh, don't use your name, don't use your name, use your initials because they only want to hear from male writers. And I thought that really blew me away. I mean, my favorite writers are Walter Mosley, um, Allende, El James Elroy, um, Ethel Waters got me through, you know, 10 months of cancer treatment, Nora Thurston. I mean, I read these books and I think, my God, you know, um, 
and then I'm writing this little novel and I go back and forth between say the 70s and the 80s and 90s. And just in that small 20 some period link, link of time, the language and the things people said changed so much. I go to the old newspaper archives to see what is appropriate to say, what isn't appropriate to say, and then do I change that to make it not real and it, like it didn't happen and it just went away, you know? So those are the sorts of things that I'm kind of fighting with right now. Um, I, I don't know, you know, I would never want to say something that was inappropriate but yet I would not want to gloss over the real, you know, the things that happened. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I hope. <laughs> yeah. So like, I guess what I'm kind of suggesting is like, what if you give those thoughts and perspective to a character in the yeah. book and let, and write it in, write into it yeah. potentially, you know, like, um, yeah, like uh, even if like a, a maybe a book takes place in like a small town that happens to be all white or something uh -huh. and there is an exposure to like, you know, people people from other backgrounds yeah. for whatever reason, the, there's ways that the narrative or the characters in the book can at, can like acknowledge that, you yeah. know, like, and so, yeah, th that's kind of what I'm suggesting. Yeah. Which so, is going on now. Great. great. Um, Sorry. Uh, very quickly, Catherine, did you want to add anything? Because I also want to move into a, a, a yeah. I'll just quickly, you know, address just a couple of things. Like Joss on the topic of Joss Whedon and and you know time time periods changing. Everything becomes problematic with enough time. On a long enough timeline, everything's going to become problematic because getting to a place of being correct and one hundred percent percent respectful, like it's a journey. It's not an endpoint that we're going to get to where like now everything's perfect like we don't know what we don't know things are going to keep changing and you know liking things that are problematic now but in their own time or you know even you know if they're problematic now and they're from now but we're problematic now but in their own time we're not recognized as problematic that doesn't mean you're problematic enjoying things that are problematic doesn't mean that you are problematic or bad is I think it's just important to examine the things about them that are problematic as we enjoy them. You know, there's there's things from the 80s and 90s that I still really like and they have problematic aspects. And I just try to be mindful as I'm enjoying them. Like what what can we learn from the mistakes that were made in the past, you know, that that we can just not repeat. And the uh, the other thing I want to address regarding writing diverse characters from a perspective of someone who is in the majority. Um, is that what I hear a lot of times is writers asking me or writers asking questions in forums and, and groups is, um, you know, what is the purpose of putting a character into my story who is diverse? Like, don't, what, don't they have to have a reason in the story to be queer, to be black, to be disabled? You know, what is this character's, you know, what is, the, I don't have a reason for being queer. Okay. I don't have a reason for being disabled. That's just the person I am. Like, that's just the way I was born, the way that I am, um, it does color my life experience. You know, it does affect my life experience. So I would say, you know, when you are thinking about putting characters into a story who are different from you, um, who have life experiences that you haven't had, it, don't examine it from the point of like, does the story demand that this person be different? But rather like this person is different in some way from my, you know, dominant life experience in a way that I don't fully understand and examine how that might affect that character and color that character's experience and perspective. And please also remember that we're not like diverse in a vacuum, you know, like we're like, okay, well, I, I need someone who's diverse. So I have one queer character, like no queer person doesn't have more queer friends, right? Like we, we have army, we're like armies of queer people. So even if your character is the only queer person in the story or, you know, whatever community a character might come from, just be mindful that in their experience outside of the immediate social group that's in the story, they've probably got more going on. Like the hate you give, if anyone has read that, was a great example of, you know, this main character who's going to a predominantly white school and she is a black character from an underprivileged area of 
of her city. And, you know, her peers in the white school see her as like the black friend, like she's our black friend who goes to our school, but she has this whole other life, you know, this whole other realm of experience and other friends. So just try to be mindful that like, if, if there's a social group and I'm like, okay, I'm the disabled person in the social group, but I'm not the disabled person in my social group. Like my social group has a lot of people with similar disabilities to what I have, you know, my, my social group that doesn't necessarily fully overlap, but in that Venn diagram where I'm in the middle, like I also know a lot more people. So unless you're writing about, for instance, like, you know, a small town pre-internet, you know, with, with one person who stands out like a sore thumb because they're the person who's different, you know, maybe that person doesn't know a lot of other people like themselves and that colors their experience. But I think in, in you know, this day and age, most people who are, you know, other to, to me, I, I know that they're not other to themselves. Like in their umwelt, <laughs> they know a lot of people who are like them and they're not the one, you know, token person. Right. That's such a good point. Thank you. I, I'm just going to say we, we, the, our last session or the one before I forget was all about writing different voices, like how, how to write, um, you know, the voice of your characters that are different from each other. And what more way to have them have different voices is to make them actually be different, you know, <laughs> and not just because it's important to the story or, or has anything to do with the story necessarily. So that's true. Um, and as far as content, I still love 16 candles, even though it's awful now, but <laughs> okay. So I'm kind of taking a, uh, you know, today in general, I'm taking sort of a broader view and narrowing it down, getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So let's get into the really small stuff. And I know there are at least a couple of you chomping at the bit for this. How do we actually write people? <laughs> so like, um, Stacy, you said earlier, you know, that you describe the people of character, but you don't describe the white people or something, because that's the assumption that white people don't need to be described. So does that mean just describing everybody equally? And then in terms of, I'm piling in a lot, in terms of like, don't use food, what do you do? Right, right. Um, yeah, I think you, you know, I think you do describe everybody equally. And that there's very creative ways, it's a challenge, you know, but it's very creative ways for us to find out that these characters, you know, the characters are white, you know, from the world that they're in or, you know, when they're introduced or, or something. Um, sometimes, sometimes what I tell some of my writers, or I should say some of my clients, not necessarily my writers, is that like when it comes to a character of color, if he's black, it's okay say he's black, you know, you do skin, you know, was it was as dark as midnight. You don't have to compare him to coal or, or, or anything like that. It's okay to just say he's black, you know, um, when it comes to indigenous characters, I, I always tell people, you, you know, know, that we've to be described in, in an honorable way usually by tribe, like, you know, figure that out because we are all not the same. So, you know, if somebody is um, Dene or um, Anishinaabe or something like that, then say so, you know, it's, it's, it's okay to just say, you know, well, you know, she was, she's this, this or this, you know, it's, it, you know, and challenge, like I said, it's a challenge um, to think that way and to expand your own creative mind um, when the when the fallback has always been, well, I don't have to I don't have to do that because everybody else is is white, you know. So, um, I yeah, that's that's just a couple of my suggestions. I think that's that's kind of refreshing to me because I personally, my personal style, I get sort of frustrated when the language is too flowery <laughs> and too like poetic. So to just say it outright sounds like, you know, yeah. just speak normally and just stay yeah, there. yeah. <laughs> okay um other yeah, thoughts it's, it's okay <laughs> <laughs> Catherine or Linda do you want to that sure um yeah I'll I'll jump in um and just say you know as as Stacy was saying it's fine to say outright someone is black someone uses a wheelchair someone you know is queer that's fine 
Um, I think it's also fine. It's also important to keep in mind that if don't limit the way in which characters are described to the way that they look necessarily. Like if someone is other to to you know to you, and as Stacy said, it's it's critical to give the same pair like to give parody and description. Like don't assume that unless I specify otherwise, everyone is is white. Um, but look, you know, when you are giving descriptive language or giving descriptions, you know, go beyond what someone's skin color is. Like there are other physical descriptors that you can use that are that are respectful. And you can also look at the way, you know, you can also just give descriptions that are different in terms of um, like people's experience, the things that people talk about, um, the places that they're from, the languages that they speak. I, I don't love writing in accents because I think that unless you know a vernacular or a, um, a dialect extremely well, you can really, you can kind of slide down into mockery really quickly. Um, but it is, you know, important to just look at like, if people are different, it's, it's beyond skin color, right? It's not just that like, well, this person's different because their skin color is, is different from mine, but like they might have a whole experience that's different, you know, from yours. If your book is set in, you know, in the United States today, if your book is set in the United States 30 years ago, um, if your book is set in a, in a fantasy world, you know, that their experience could be different based on, you know, it's not just the description of the character and the way you let people know that your character is who they are should go well beyond, you know, I think just their skin color and their physical, you know, exterior. And uh, an anecdote that I like to tell, and Renee will laugh because it, it goes back to my favorite thing that I'm always talking about, which is Alien, the movie Alien and Aliens, my favorite movies of all time. Um, but it's one of my favorite anecdotes and it comes from screenwriting is that when the screenplay for Alien was written, you know, it was written and it was given to, you know, to like the casting director and the casting director was like, wait, you didn't specify which of these characters are women and which of them are men. And the screenwriters were like, it doesn't matter. Like just cast some of each, like just pick, you pick. And Sigourney Weaver was cast as Ripley because the casting director was like, yeah, they said put a few women in there. Like that was not a role that was written for a woman, right? It was just a role that was written for a warrant officer on a spaceship and a casting director, you know, 40, 50, oh gosh, 40 years ago. Like how old is that movie now? I always feel like it came out 20 years ago. Um, you know, chose to put a woman in that role and made that decision. And making that decision has completely changed the landscape of roles for women in action and science fiction over the 40 years since then. Like it has made a tremendous, like if they had said, eh, you know, let's let's cast some of the minor characters as women, but like, let's reserve the main roles for, you know, men. And it's, that's part of what made that movie such a sensation and as memorable as it is, is that like, in, if you think back to 1979 and you're going to a, you know, a, a, a matinee movie or a, you know, a Friday night, you think you're going to see a movie about Tom Skerritt and John Hurt, right? And uh, Ian Holm, who are famous. You don't think you're going to see a movie about Sigourney Weaver that nobody's ever heard of. Like that's what made that movie memorable. But someone just made a decision and said, you know, I wrote these characters irrespective of, you know, of their gender. And let's go ahead and just cast them and then look at the way, you know, from there that the gender might affect what they bring to the role. I mean, there's definitely, you know, there's definitely stuff in there that is relevant to their gender, but, you know, it was a, just a decision, like, this character didn't need to have a, it didn't need to be relevant to the plot that she was a woman, right? This is just, this is just who she is. It's just part of her experience and what she brings to her job as an officer on a spaceship. Um, so, it, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I just, I just wish that it weren't a horror movie because I've actually never seen it because I'm too afraid to. Well, then but watch Aliens because Aliens is an action movie and you don't need to have seen Alien to see Aliens. Yeah, I should. I will someday. Um, <laughs> but you're, you're so right. And the cat too. There's a, that's like one good example of a, of a positive cat in Hollywood. I wrote a thing about how cats are depicted as evil and it's, it's like misogyny basically because cat, women are cats, men are dogs and so on. I won't get into that. So, um, <laughs> but I can share the link if you want. Anyway. Um, okay. So, oh my goodness. I also, I also add one yeah. thing. Um, you know, everything we're talking about can also happen in revision. Like don't let the fear of doing it wrong parallel paralyze you. 
and and just get it down and then and then you can get the feedback we can do the interrogate you can see what's on the page and also one thing that hasn't yet i don't think been mentioned is also like considering writing from the perspective of a character who's more accessible to you rather than trying you know so that you can approach representation you know and, and inclusivity which i love that everyone here wants to do this and it's great but you know if it's not something that you can access appropriately in that way okay create a narrative perspective that you can be the outsider who is interrogating these these important things or or you know having that that worldview um, grappling with these questions that's great thank you that is really important advice uh to not let it paralyze you and you can go back and fix it later. Um, we, it, first of all, it's already oh, 12 minutes to 12 already. Um, would it be okay if we went a little bit longer? Are people all right with that? Are you, the three of you all okay with that? Or do you have to be somewhere? It's okay. Awesome. Okay, great. Um, uh, Cause I want to ask a very quick question. Well, no, I don't know if it's quick. And then I want to open it up to other, other questions. Uh, I sort of want to get more into the nitty gritty, but what I'm wondering right now is if you have a person uh, who is, you know, from an older time or who is the bad guy or who is intentionally racist or intentionally whatever it is, how do you approach that character? How do you, you know, how do you, how do you do that? <laughs> it's thorny. <laughs> I'm assuming that's. I would I would say like a, a first step, a first good step is, you know, don't make this like a one dimensional mustache twirling evil, like, you know, sort of character, like a one dimensional, like my, his thing is being racist, you know, he's from this time. And, and that's how, you know, I think it's important to look at how, um, you know, people in their time may have felt like they had good intentions, may have been coming from a place of not, you know, they're not one dimensional people. What they're doing is wrong. You know, what they're doing is evil in any context. You know, um, if someone is racist, if someone is, you know, a misogynist, if someone is, um, you know, a bigot or, or discriminatory in that way. Um, but everyone is intersectional, including people who are bad. Like everyone brings multiple identities. No one is just one thing. Um, and I think it's helpful to look at, you know, what that character's motivations are and how they perceive themselves as a good person and the hero of their own story and not just have them kind of be a one-dimensional like evil for the sake of being evil because we needed a bad guy in the story. Such a good point, yeah. And, and those are better characters too. Those are more interesting characters, you know, looking at television, the more interesting bad guys, quote unquote, think that they're doing the right thing. Um, Lorinda or Stacy, did you want to add? Um, are you there, Stacy? You can go first yes, if you are. Um, I I just have to, no again, work. No I can go first if it's better for you. Yeah. Um, okay. okay. Um, uh, I think uh, in addition to what I've been talking about with narrative perspective, you might consider also the um, organization of your manuscript. Um, you know, the way that you open your story sets the tone for the rest of the novel um or or whatever it is that you're working on sorry whatever your your piece is so um considering that setting the opening of your story from a particular narrative perspective is going to inform how we as the reader understand everything that follows um so that that's one tip there i would say um and the other i think you know people have been writing really bad characters for a long time too you know and <laughs> you can always i think look and see how are the antagonists crafted how are, not just antagonists but particularly villainous characters maybe if that's what you're you're working with um uh, and, and uh i think also in general making sure that you're bringing in what is the community like that will help yeah. us contextualize the characters because like Catherine said, you know, they're not in a vacuum, right? So um, bringing in, taking advantage of the setting and the community members and the ways that they react to these characters um, can also help us get a sense of that. 
Right. It's so right. Funny. My, yes. Sorry, just my husband, the last few days has been very diligent about the book that he's, uh, you know, working on a book. And I said, I asked him last night, why, where did this motivation come from? And he said he just finished a really me mediocre book and it motivated him. So. <laughs> Go ahead, Stacey. That's great. That's great. Um, so the um, I have a unpublished novel that is out with um, a couple agents right now um, that I've been trying to find a publisher, find, trying to find representation for it for a while now. And in that book that um, it, it is the antagonist is, um, is this man who's the leader of a white supremacist group. And he actually um, uh, is, is set on starting a race war, you know? So um, he's, he's like a cult leader, you know? So for me to write him was, um, was really, really difficult. Like it took a long time for me to actually get into, you know, who Raymond was, and where he came from. And the story itself is also um, based on the fact that it, it's really about this woman who's a mixed blood um, detective. And if you follow her lineage all the way back to um, slavery times and back to the 1800s in, in the Northern Plains, you know, the, the um, slave owner or the slave trader who captured her great, 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 great how many greats back um, is, re is the, the direct, directly um, related to the, um, the white supremacist. So I, I wrote this full history all the way back for all those characters. And to, to do that well, I also had to find the, um, the tragedy in the, in the um, bad characters life you know what had happened to him how did he learn to you know believe the things that he believes what drove him to do to react to things the way he did what was he taught where did that come from that whole sense of power and privilege and and how it all um comes together in this this kind of prophetic fight between this white supremacist and this cop who's the, the descendant of these, these two women, um, indigenous and, um, and um, Wola from um, African. So um, what you just said was in about, um, Lorinda, about um, community is so true because in his community, he may be the leader, but then there's also like the men who work for him, the men who, who responded to his call to come for their own reasons to be participants in this race war. And they're all struggling with their own understanding of like, well, this is what I feel because I, I was taught this, or this is why I'm angry about the people of color in this country. This is what I'm unsure of, you know? And, and so by having them be in different levels of it um, and different than Raymond, than their, their leader, it gives this whole um, context which I think takes us further away from just having that, like, um, like the one bad guy who's just evil and only evil and everybody who follows him must be evil and only evil, you know? Um, Cause there's a, obviously there's a huge juxtaposition between the bad guy and then the cop and, you know, the people who want to stop him. But even then, you know, the other officers and the people in, in that community are at different levels of understanding their own racial identity, their own place in the society, their own um, approach and code to being a police officer, you know, um, being one of only few um, detectives of color in a large police force like in Minneapolis, you know, um, and the fact that it's Minneapolis after what we've been going through with, you know, the, the murder of Mr. Floyd and what has happened on our streets and within our communities and stuff that all comes into play. And, and no two people are exactly the same. You know, me, me as an advocate and all of my friends who are advocates and activists um, of color, mixed, queer, you know, white, we are all from a different place and we all have various degrees of things that change us or drive us. And I think good characters, well-developed characters have to, you know, be written the same way. So, you know, technically there are things like that to do. So the bad guy is not just, you know, the one note bad guy. 
That's so true. Yeah. And, and hopefully give them a good backstory. Not like what I've heard about Cruella, for example, but anyway. <laughs> oh yeah. I haven't seen that. I haven't seen it, but I've heard that they made up something about how Cruella's mother was pushed off a cliff by a bunch of Dalmatians. And that's why she hates Dalmatians. It just sounds like ridiculousness. Anyway. Uh, oh, really? <laughs> Watch the pitch meeting about it. Anyway, um, so I'm going to open it up to questions now. I know I have at least two already that are, that uh, you know, two people who have written to me in the chat. Um, so I'm going to start with Sin Maiden, if you're ready. And I'm going to put you on the screen. I hope that's okay. Uh, where are you? I'm going to pin you, uh, if that's all right. Sin, are you? I'm here. Right. No, I, that's not what I meant to do, but go ahead. <laughs> where am I? Um, I am, okay. Um, I, as I said before, I have two books that I've published and I've been wanting to, and I have two, a couple of books that are sequels and I've been wanting to integrate in um, people of color, but I'm not sure, you know, how to describe them or how to even expose them to the reader. I know you said, don't use um, food like cocoa or coffee um, chocolate, I can understand that. So how else do you go about doing that? I, I will share resources as well, but. Well, I think, I think some of the things like we've already talked about, you know, um, there's so much more to describe a character other than their skin color. You know, where is this character from? Where did they grow up? Um, and it's okay to say, you know, it, like, for instance, you know, this character is, you know, is black um, and, li you know, lived in the all black part of a city. You know, this is what they believe in. This is how they function in their world. You know, all of those things develop the character of color beyond, you know, just their skin color. Um, and let me think. Especially in their actions. In other words, What's say. that? I, I'm sorry, say again. I think they were just asking what you said. Repeat, could you repeat a little bit of what you said? Oh, okay. I, I said that this is, um, you know, and it, this is like what we've been talking about, you know, um, developing characters to be more than their skin color you know, and think about where they've come from, um, where they grew up, the impact that has on them, you know, how they view life, how they view their place, you know, and obviously, you know, in connection to the story that you're telling. Um, but all of those things can show us that this person is a character of color, you know. Um, so, so I'm, I'm trying to Without no, really knowing your story, um, it's hard for me to say this is how to describe them. Um, but if I understand you correctly, you you want to include um, characters of color in your novel. You just don't know how to describe them. Um, that's but right. My, I think that's right, Stacy. Yeah, so, um, and yeah. I want to introduce a detective into one of my stories, but you know, I don't know that it's it's relevant as to where he's come from. Um, although I guess I could say that he's from Northwest Pasadena and uh, went to a particular high school that was predominantly black. I don't know that that is necessarily enough to fully describe him. Right. Um, well, see this, okay, so this is something that, um, something that I talk about a lot with my co-producer, and that is that if you looked at the, mo like if you create a mosaic of the, all the characters in the story you're telling, and you include um, somebody who has been traditionally marginalized or somebody who um, um, is the, the other, you know, different than everybody else or something, um, and even if you, even if it's not about like, even the story, you, if the story you're telling is not about race, it is still about race, you know, because you have a different, you have a character there that is non-white. This is still going to be about race, even if you don't actually 
you know, make it a, you know, uh, a, a fight, an argument, a statement of whatever it is um, about, about that person's um, um, race and color, ethnicity, whatever it is. Um, I hear you about not, about, you know, you don't want to include irrelevant information. You know, what's, what's the point of, you know, talking about his high school if that is not relevant to the story that you're telling. Um, however, if he is a detective and he's a, a black detective in Pasadena, I would bet that he may be the only or one of very few black detect detectives on the Pasadena police force. I think that matters and how he maneuvers that space while doing his work matters, you know, and, and it could be the statement as much as like, you know, when he joined the force, you know, he was, he was the only one, or he was one of two, you know, or um, because that impacts, that does impact how he does his work, you know, so that, that may be a place for you to give us a little bit more about him being of color. And then we know that. We know that he's well aware of, of um, how, you know, was it easy for him to be accepted? Was it not? You know, was he hesitant? You know, did, you know, it's true that people of color have to work, you know, twice as hard as everybody else to get half as much, you know? I mean, so that, all of that could really impact him, especially because he's a police officer. You know, and um, so you can include that information, and that would develop him as a black character. So does does that make any sense? I, I really want to. I really hope that I'm helping you here. No, no, that. that's helpful, Stacy. Um, I think that's a good way to okay. integrate him into the story, as far as conversation with one of the other characters. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And then we then we remember that about him as the story goes on, you know, like we do any character, the things we learn when they're first identified. And then we see that and we understand in his relationships with the other police officers or his relationships with uh, um, the perpetrators or, you know, the people in the community that he encounters in Pasadena um, around this crime or, or whatever. We know that that is part of his lens of how he is approaching them. Thank you. I'll also mention that that I I okay. I'm not the uh, the best reader, <laughs> and I've really only started reading fiction, really, a couple of years ago. But I but I'm constantly losing track of what characters look like. I always forget what characters look like, and I hate to say that I I think I assume more often than not that they're white. But whether they're brunette or like you know, oh, I always thought he was a blonde, and then they say no, he's brunette, and I'm like, oh, right, okay, you know, I forget. So it, I guess it's in some ways it doesn't matter as much and in other ways you can put it in there more often, I guess. Um, thank you. Um, uh, Barbara had a, a question which I'm happy to ask for you or if you want to come on, I can, do you want me to ask for you? Okay, so Barbara said in the chat, um, I like what you said about writing in dialect, but what about writing dialogue as it's said? I have a Mexican character who can't speak English all that well. Is there anything wrong with writing their dialogue as they would say it? Sometimes I hear criticism that writers make characters sound more articulate or literate than they are because they're afraid of offending. And that's something I wanted to get into more with the writing in different voices. And I'm not sure how much we did. It, it, it gets dangerous where you can get into stereotype and you know, caricature and that sort of thing. Yeah, I so I think a great place to start is to look at authors who have done this well and how they do it. Um, Alice Walker is, is an author who does this extremely well, um, writes characters dialogue in exactly the way that they speak. And so does Zora Neale Hurston. Like Their Eyes Were Watching God is, is a great example of character speaking um, in, in dialect exactly as they, they spoke. Um, and I think what's important if you look at both of these stories is that Hurston and Walker write from their own experience and they're not writing other people as they imagine other people would speak. I think that's where we run into danger is, is you know, when, when we think that like, okay, I am a person who speaks English fluently and I'm a person who does not speak Spanish. Um, my partner is Puerto Rican and Spanish is his first language and um, he didn't learn English until he was in his, his mid thirties. Um, so, 
you know, from, from my perspective, like I know how he speaks and I would never attempt to write the way he speaks down as dialect um, in a story is being told as a white person. Um, because I know that other people who are native English speakers can perceive that as a demonstration of someone's ignorance, right? Like their facility with the language is not good. And historically, and I'm not saying that's the perspective that you are coming from, certainly, but historically, when we read that, when we read someone um, whose dialect is being told in broken English, um, we associate that with ignorance or lack of education. And my partner is the smartest person I know. I think that when you hear someone who has an accent, when you're living in a place where English is the dominant language and you hear someone who has an accent, you know, I don't speak any other languages. Like that means this person knows more languages than me. Um, and that's automatically a sign, you know, that, that this is someone who can communicate in two different languages. Like there, this is clearly a sign of intelligence, but it's not perceived that way in writing. So I just think that, you know, from a respectful writing standpoint, you have to be so careful um, when, you know, when writing from, um, when writing dialogue, putting dialogue into the mouth of a character, um, whose experience is very different from yours, because you, you probably don't want it to come across as like, well, this character is not educated. Um, but I think there's ways to do that also without writing it as dialect to say, you know, like to just say like this character struggles with English, like to show your character struggling with it, like stopping to pause to come up with a word or, you know, or asking someone, gosh, like what's, what's the word for that again? Um, rather than, you know, trying to write an accent you know, or to write, you know, broken English as you imagine, broken English sounding, because that's, that's just, if there's ways to write around it, I always try to write around it, because it's, you know, it's very, it's, it's just really dangerous. I consider it like a really dangerous area to write. Definitely. Yeah, like, you, a lot of times you can just say, like, you know, they, this character ha has a, a thick, some kind of accent, you know, whatever is the accent, that, and then you just write the dialogue, with their meaning, you know, or, or you can say that maybe, maybe depending on the narrative perspective, like maybe the narrator, I don't know if the narrator's understanding them or not. So I think it's more about what the narrator's understanding and saying what the, like, you know, like um, they spoke with a thick, thick accent and I, I couldn't understand, which I was embarrassed about, or I, you know what I'm saying? Like if, if you have a narrator in the first person versus like, um, they had an accent, which remind, you know, which I could tell was from Mexico and, and they said this, and then you can just write what they said as in order to convey the meaning of what they said. Like, you don't need to write in the broken English. You can just write in what was intended and tell the reader that they said it in broken English, for example. Thank you. I, I did, um, First of all, I want to say very quickly, if you have a question, if other people have questions, please use the Zoom, uh, the little Zoom indication. Uh, if you look at the bottom under reactions, there's a thing that says raise hand. Uh, and then that will jump you to the front and I will be able to see that you have a question. So please do that. Um, and then I'll just, uh, I, after the writing in vo different voices session that we had a month ago or two, whatever it was, I asked uh, about that because, um, uh, Alex, who's here, had written a little a little thing, a little example during the workshop about a person who was drunk and how she was, you know, insisting that she wasn't drunk, but clearly slurring her words and that kind of thing. And I asked the 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 speaker, how would you write that, like visually? And there are things that you can do with spacing, you know, with like typography um, that are not necessarily about the language itself, but that can put that. You know that can convey that 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 hesitation or whatever. So that there's more to it. And my my husband, who is a he has a comic, what do you call it, a web comic. He works in that kind of thing a lot because the speech bubbles that he creates, he'll change them. You know, and we're we're not doing anything as visual as that, but but it is a similar kind of visual approach to it as opposed to just oral. Yeah. Something, some advice that I, I try to give writers is, you know, if you want to write in a dialect, you should know that dialect. If you want to write a character speaking African-American vernacular English, you should know it. If you don't know it, you probably should not imitate just based on the way it sounds to you as a person who doesn't know it. I would feel very comfortable writing a character speaking a Valley Girl accent because I picked it up when I was in LA. I would feel very comfortable writing a character with 
you know, a, a Baltimore accent, because that's where I'm from, hun, <laughs> you know, or I feel very comfortable maybe, you know, writing a Southern accent, although I would do it with caution because the Southern American accent does have connotations, even for white people, you know, that, that it could be a connotation of ignorance, it could be a connotation of racism, you know, and I wouldn't want to, I would not want to use accents in people's speech patterns to convey that. Yeah, thank you. One thing I feel like is important to add, which hopefully is implied already, um, is that, you know, the way that you as the author choose to describe someone's accent or someone's appearance um, should obviously be considered carefully um, in that it should um, probably, you know, shouldn't be demeaning and it needs to also fit the tone of the interaction in an appropriate way. Like we, I know we were using the example of broken English, but you know, maybe don't say broken English. Maybe like, you know, they, depending on the tone, maybe they, they spoke with a lilting accent, you know, or they, um, you know, whatever, whatever it might be, like just consider how the, much like when describing someone's appearance, um, like one line that does, yeah, never mind. I won't get into like uh, the help again because it gets into a whole other thing. But let's just say, be thoughtful about those considerations and images and, and words that we choose um, in order to convey a certain character um, and, and their overall characterization. That's great. So um, I'm not seeing any hands. Um, um, although Suzette wrote in the uh, chat, buzzwords and regional phrasing is good too. And that, that, that makes some sense to me, I think. Um, but what are, what are some more of those pitfalls? So you said, you know, don't say broken English, for example, um, don't use, you know, uh, food to describe people of color or whatever. What are some of those other little pratfalls that we, not pratfalls, that's not the right word, pitfalls, I guess, that we don't think about. Because I both of those, frankly, are relatively new to me. <laughs> so what are other things like that that we just don't think about? I'll, I'll say from the perspective of the disability community and, and the community of people with disabilities and uh, learning disabilities, cognitive disabilities, um, don't talk about people as being victims um, of, of their circumstance or, or their conditions. Don't talk about people as being confined to their assistive or adaptive technology. Um, it's fine to say that someone, you know, for instance, uses a wheelchair. It's not so great to say that someone is confined to a wheelchair. Um, it's, you know, the wheelchair, if, if someone uses a wheelchair like that, that helps them. That's not, you know, that's not victimizing them. It's, you know, if you're saying that someone, you know, has cancer, they have cancer, you know, they're not a victim of cancer, unless that is how someone specifically wants to identify, you know, people aren't victims of stroke, they experience a stroke. Um, this is also true with like mental health conditions specifically, like if you're trying to describe someone's personality, maybe don't use a disability to describe a personality in a negative way. You know, this, this, there's if someone who's moody isn't bipolar, you know, someone who is um, behaving in a way that's inexplicable is not spastic or psychotic. Um, those that kind of language um, is is good to kind of just think conscientiously about when you're when you're using it. That's amazing. Thank you. That's awesome. Um, I shoot, of course, yeah, again, I was gonna say something related to that. And it just went right into my head. Um, Oh, oh, I know what it was. Um, at my job, I, I write for a, um, Nikki Swift, which is a sort of a gossip magazine, although it's not as bad, you know, pop culture gossip thing, but it's not as bad as some others <laughs> are out there. But one of the things they talked about recently kind of related to that is that uh, the idea of equating cancer or, or illness, serious illness with war and with fighting and battles is not something that everybody does you know if they if they phrase it themselves that way if the person going through it phrases it as you know i'm fighting this war with cancer then we can do it but otherwise we don't want to write it that way because it, it uh i'm not going to remember exactly the reasons why but it it it's uh, you know they didn't lose their battle you know oh, they yeah. they 
dealt with it as easily as they could but you know but not everybody likes to put it in those terms so and again that's something that i hadn't occurred to me at all <laughs> it's it's very personal um to people who have who have illnesses and if you have a character who has an illness maybe they identify as a survivor or maybe they identify as a person who's fighting a battle but it's not universal i think that's what's important to remember is not everyone characterizes their experience with an illness um that way. And I think very in a very specific circumstance when we talk about suicide, you know, yeah. people people kill themselves, people lose their lives to suicide, but people don't commit suicide. It's not a crime. You know, it's not it's there's a lot of language. I mean, I won't get into specifics, but that's definitely something if you're if you're writing about mental health issues or characters who experience mental health issues to look at the sensitive writing around those issues um, because a lot of the ways that we use language around health and mental health issues are extremely problematic and that's very slowly changing. That's amazing. Yeah, so yeah. go ahead, Miranda, sorry. As I was just gonna add to that, as writers, we are, are in, we are people who are attentive to language, right? So I think in general, if, if something is um, like a too familiar phrase or a too familiar trope, of a character or some aspect of a character, you might want to interrogate that and see if maybe there's some fresher way to talk about it. And that will probably serve you better. Or in, in the same with characters, right? Like we, again, consider whether this is a little too familiar for this type of character. How can we complicate them and round them out to feel like more real human beings, right? So a lot of these things I think come down just to general issues of craft, um, good craft, you know? Um, so seeing, yeah, just finding as writers using language as our tool to facilitate that best representation. So true. And a lot of what we talk about here in this group is craft generally. So yeah, <laughs> we all could use that. Um, it, it is almost 20 after uh, 12 um so thank you so much for being here if you need to leave of course that's fine um i want to say thank you to my incredible panelists stacy parshall jansen Catherine forrest and lorinda toledo thank you so much for being here do you, you so uh, do, do do are there any last minute things yes thank you uh any last minute things that either the three of you would like to say or that anyone would like to say um wait I, I just want to say thank you for, you know, having having me here and and this has been wonderful to meet all of you and I'm, I'm excited that um, with everybody's work that is going to be out there living in the world and, um, you know, just, yeah, keep doing what you're doing this. This is wonderful. So thank you so much, Renee. Thank you for inviting me and holding space for me. I'm here. I'm so glad to have you here. And it's good to see you too. We've missed you since you moved from LA. Yeah, yeah. I miss LA too. A lot. <laughs> um, Catherine or Linda? Linda, go ahead. Yeah, I, I second everything Stacy said. I'm really inspired by all of you and your projects. Um, it feels good to like be doing this work with other writers in community. So thank you for all for that. And thank you for having me and engaging in this conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Lorinda. Catherine, yeah. thank you so much for having me um, and for taking the time this morning or this afternoon, um, everyone. And thanks to um, Stacey and Lorinda as well for, for joining. This has been a great conversation. Um, and I'm really pleased and happy that so many folks showed up to, to participate in, in this panel and ask questions and listen. That's just really encouraging. Um, it makes me really happy. And uh, yeah, you know, as a parting thought, like never be afraid to write diverse characters because there are, there are sensitivity readers like Stacey who can, you know, yep. help you with your manuscript. <laughs> when in doubt, you know, there's there's a solution to make sure if you're if there's any inkling in your mind of like, gosh, maybe I didn't handle this well enough, sensitivity readers can help you. Yep. 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 That's what we do. <laughs> yeah. And if you want to put your contact in, excuse me, in the chat or whatever, feel free. Um, and of course, there's always Facebook messaging. You're all in the Facebook yeah. group. So you can message each other on Facebook. Um, I just put uh, resources, some resources in the uh, chat. I put it as a um, an attachment because there are links embedded, and I didn't 
and it's not pretty it's not fancy it's this week's been insane so i haven't had a chance to make it look pretty but <laughs> the information is what's important so uh hopefully that's good and i'll post it in the um the group as well okay. uh, one quick last question uh, a couple of people asked if this if i could make this um you know available to people like put it on youtube or something do mostly i've recorded i want to take a look at the recording but mostly i've recorded just the three speakers and myself uh, except for sin when she asked her question um does anyone have a problem if i post it online or what do you no i'm okay with that no it's not I'm like very comfortable well. with that as well you're no good problem. likewise okay yeah. great i don't have a lot of activity on my channel but you never know <laughs> <laughs> so all right um well thank you thank you so much i i i appreciate you being here everyone yeah and, thank you i'm thank happy you yeah Bye. I'm having Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.